I've taught a lot of different people with different attitudes and limiting beliefs over many years to do amazing skills using my science and teaching background. I love seeing people of all shapes and sizes improve. And perhaps the biggest lie in all of education is talent. The idea that some people are just born being able to innately do something while everyone else is doomed to suck because they weren't. This is also the biggest cop out and red flag I see in some teachers or people who attempt to teach that signals to me that they do not understand how learning works and the likelihood that they can actually help you or some cases even want to help you learn a skill despite whatever their celebrity status is is low. Talent is prevalent and is closely associated to the idea of instant learning where people think that they can skip learning information and immediately get skills that are more complex than pushing a button. In my experience, some people who don't know or just don't care tend to default to the idea of instant learning. So let's understand, what are you actually innately born being able to do? That gives you certain advantages and disadvantages among others. How does your brain actually gain skills at any of those amazing things that you want that makes talent an uneducated person's fantasy? Also, we can walk away understanding what the best behaviors are that you can do to achieve amazing amazing things. When you're born, you are hardwired with specific reflexes and the power of being able to breathe, recognize and make facial expressions to show your emotion, count how many objects are around you, learn sounds, you have a stepping reflex to walk, grasp objects, and you can cry, see, smell, and taste. That's pretty much it. But then other differences, genetic differences, do arise that can slightly or significantly influence things like your athletic success, your intelligence, providing you with certain advantages or predispositions. But a word of encouragement is genetics often is subservient to training. Because your brain is an amazing changing machine, personal effort and training can dramatically change you, and even if you somehow realize that you've hit the genetic lottery, hard work is critical in determining how much of your genetic potential even gets realized. Many of us will die from old age long before we ever reach whatever our potential might be. Now, specifically when it comes to how genetics affects your intelligence. Studies suggest that somewhere around 40 to 80% of your intelligence is genetic, while the rest being 20 to 60% of your intelligence is based on your own actions to work out your brain. The reason why this margin is so wide is it shows just how much people can let their environment determine how hard they work, while others don't and instead stimulate their brain as much as they can. Even if someone is born with a higher IQ, all of the things that make them smart, like how fast the neurons can fire, how plastic their brain is, you can improve all of these by your actions, and not just by a little if you really go at it. Then there's your physical advantages or differences. For muscle, your genetics give you a 40 to 80% predisposition to how easily you put on more muscle and to how many slow and fast twitch muscle fibers you have. Your aerobic capacity or VO2 max, which is the maximum amount of oxygen that you can use during intense or maximal exercise, is about 50% of your genetics, with the remaining 50% being influenced by factors like training and fitness. The strength of your tendons and ligaments along with their flexibility is about 50 to 60 percent genetic. Recovery speed is suggested to be 30 to 50 percent genetics. Even how efficiently your body uses energy at rest is 40 to 70 percent genetic. The most important takeaway though is in our society. Just like some people are blinded by the fantasy of talent like my high school gym teacher who somehow thought juggling was a heritable skill you're born with, it's not, the reason for these wide percentage ranges is because researchers can't tell how much of this is people just not wanting to work so hard to realize their full potential, while others who are seen as amazing is actually them just working their butt off. Also, we can't change our genetics. Yet. So if you can't control it, who cares? Now here's one of the most exciting things that I get to tell students. One amazing way the brain learns any new skill you could 
could possibly want is through an incredible thing called neural reuse, where your brain reuses all the existing wiring it can that it just tacks the new skill onto. The brain is insanely efficient, and rather than constantly building new wiring every time you learn something new, if, for example, you've never tasted or smelled raspberries before, but you're familiar with strawberries, your brain will reuse as many currently existing connections it possibly can, so your perception of what a raspberry tastes and smells like is actually 60 to 80% the same exact pathways you use for strawberries. The remaining 20 to 40% will either then come from somewhere else like blueberries, or your brain will finally create new wiring for any unique aspects that it can't identify. This is also the same reason why students I've seen have a way easier time learning something like a sideways backflip called a leaf, even simple neurobiology, if they already have done a physical sport or learned something like it before. The more prior experience you have, the more existing pathways the brain can simply reuse, and you will learn that skill way faster. On the other hand, students who are brand new to a motor skill such as riding a bike, playing an instrument, or asking that weird acrobatic trick guy for a private lesson in awesomeness may only have a 5 to 20% overlap to skills they've learned, and the rest needs to be painfully made from scratch, gosh darn it. Regardless of your starting IQ, your brain is already easily capable enough to learn all the skills you want, even if you think you're at the lower end of that range. There is no theoretical limit to how much your brain can improve. So simply put, talent is fake, neural reuse reigns supreme. So knowing through neural reuse, the more you learn, the faster you can learn anything else. What behaviors can you do to increase how quickly and well you learn new things? Well, first we come to something we can call your actual time on task. How many minutes do you really spend stimulating your brain to experience the new stuff? Our brain thrives on experience. It cannot change unless it, and sometimes the body, experiences what to do, because this is how your brain pinpoints exactly what pathways to reuse and what it needs to build. The more experience it gets, the better it can do this. Another big one I've talked about is the Goldilocks Zone, or the tool that has been my teaching pillar for years, where you should be where tasks are not too easy nor too hard, because this is the place Place where your brain is fully stimulated and turns your brain from the conservative survival machine that it is to actually being stimulated to change. Do the Goldilocks zone just right and you can enter a flow state where your productivity increases up to something like 500%. And now beyond this, we get to a very important term for this episode known as the spacing effect versus mass practice. Whenever you practice something, getting in as much focus repetition as you can in the Goldilocks zone is tremendous, and to go along with that, your brain is a resource hog. For any time it can reuse neurons and instead has to build, it will very cautiously and timidly build those new connections. They will be weak, and the brain will be ready to tear those suckers down at a moment's notice. This is known as the forgetting curve, where if you don't revisit those connections soon, your brain will rip them to shreds and expect you to think it. This is why mass practice for people who pull one all-nighter to study before the final exam are in trouble. The spacing effect or spaced repetition combats the natural forgetting curve, where separate from how long and hard you practice, you space out multiple learning sessions not over just one day, but over several days. This is how you can go about crushing a backflip or your genetics class, because your brain needs to see you revisit any connections it built for you. My rule of thumb for students is a rule of at least three days where you run through the specific steps you did again before throwing them away and moving up to a bunch of new ones. Because if you don't, your brain will enact its scorched earth policy and that's the end. So now, here's the big twist to everything.
thing. Despite all the strategies for maximizing learning, productivity, and neuroplasticity, there's a hidden power in completely letting go when you're not doing the thing. You see, your brain needs time to consolidate, find what neurons to reuse, what it has to build, and as we go over in the video where we talk about the maximum amount your brain can learn in one day, when your brain finally gets to relax, it will go about hunting down and destroying bad connections. In fact, all the leaps in skill and knowledge happen not while you're working hard, but while you're resting, reflecting, and most importantly, sleeping. This is when the brain truly identifies what connections were activated that it can reuse and even reinforces them, making them faster and stronger. It will also see what new connections it needs to build and do something too important for me to miss called synaptic pruning. Since your brain loves to be as efficient as possible, it will destroy weak connections along with any pesky ones that cause you to mess up. This is where your brain gets a maximum boost in its efficiency and increases how fast you can learn future skills. But if none of this was very interesting, then I saved an interesting fact for last. When you sleep, your brain learns by replaying whatever you did backwards. And we don't know why. During this replay, the brain does one of my favorite things that I love telling the students after a hard day's work, being that the brain engages in some serious error correction direction, destroying, building, and being incredibly picky, with us going over how much you can actually learn in a single day in these videos. Hope this helped you, and I'll see you in the next one.